I, Karen, when you talk about ritual and, uh, and the and practice of ritual, and we're, we're heading toward the, the unknowable, the unknowable God, and yet in ritual, um, we, we seem to suggest that we have some definition. Um, you introduce a character in your book, uh, Dennis. Yes. Um, who, uh, who, uh, who you, you say actually influenced so many of the theologians of the, uh, of the Middle Ages <coughs> at a time when theology was still available to common people. Mm. Well, Dennis had a, had a I, I won't say it's a trick, but he, he had a method, didn't he, of dealing with this problem. He had a method, and before we get on to Dennis, could I just uh, tell you, because this you'll see where I get uh, coming to, uh, to, go back to the Brahmagya competition in 10th century India. In people, 10th century before the Christ. The people of India are always in the vanguard of religious change. And the Brahmin priests developed a, a, a ritual contest. contest. They, uh, they used to, priests would go out into the jungles and make a retreat to put themselves into that receptive, different frame of mind, <coughs> fasting, doing preliminary yoga exercises. Then they'd come back, and the object of the exercise was to define Brahman, which is the ultimate reality in Hinduism. It's, the reality is this way beyond the gods. Uh, it's, it's, in all, it's called the all. And it's also within us, it's within everything, it, it suffuses everything. And because it's the all, it's unnameable. We, our minds can't get round it. But nevertheless, they tried. So the challenger would kick off with a, with, try, with a formula, a brilliant formula that he devised in the forest, full of learning and poetry, uh, that he thought encapsulated the Brahman. Got it. And then his opponents would have to listen to that and respond to it, taking it a step further. And the person who was the winner was the one who reduced everybody to silence. And in that silence, the Brahman was present. He became and felt, it was felt. And the Brahman was not present in the wordy definitions. Uh, it was present in the stunning realization of the impotence of speech. They were pushing their reason again to the ultimate point. You can see Socrates as creating a rational version of the Brahmagya, bringing you to that point of unknowing where reason can't go anymore. And theology should be doing that. Uh, now, Dennis created for uh, his parishioners and later in the West, a method that was like the Brahmagya competition for Christians. And it wasn't just for an elite group of um, uh, mystics or monks, no. It, he, he introduced, he, it was for the laity, and it was to tell them how to listen to the words of the liturgy and the words of scripture. Now, Dennis, who was he? Well, he took, he, we don't know much of anything about him. He wrote anonymously probably in the 5th or 6th centuries, and he was a Greek. Um, and he took the uh, pseudonym, the pen name of Dennis the Areopagite, the name of St. Paul's first convert in Athens. Um, and, but he became an absolute authority in the Latin world, in the West. In, when his works were translated into Latin in the 9th century, he became a number one authority uh, because people thought he might be Dennis the Areopagite. So there was a collection with St. Paul and he had almost apostolic, canonical, biblical status. And the fact that most people have never heard of him today is a symptom, I think, of our religious dilemma. Now, what Dennis said was, uh, there's a method you have to do. When you're listening to the words of scripture read aloud, you can't take the Bible literally, he said. There's no way you can talk about this. I mean, it talks about God in the first chapter as a creator, as if he were a mere artisan. It talks about God as a rock, as a, you know, as a God, you're my rock. As a, it shows God as a warrior. Even It shows God drunk and with a hangover, he says. You can't take all this literally. So what do you do with these texts? Well, listen to them. And you apply a method, uh, 
and first of all, you say, well, no, God is not uh, a rock, clearly. But though it is true that God has rock-like characteristics, because God is in that rock, because God is in everything, uh, you, you know, it has stability and permanence. It can express things about God, but it's not alive. It's obvious that God is not a rock. So you say God, you, yeah, you can see God in the rock, but God's not a rock. But then you get up to the, the top. No, God is good. What on earth do we mean by that? Is God good like a good human being? Or a good dog? Or a good meal? We use the word so literally, uh, so in so many different ways. And how, what, what can we say about God? Uh, a being that is goodness itself. We don't know, can't get our minds around that. We can't even say, Dennis said, that God exists. Because our word existence is so limited, it can't apply to God, who is the all. Um, and you say, no, 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 God is not this, God is not that. And then you say, but that's not right either. Because, I, you know, God, God, God is, God is not. God is not not. You, and finally you end up, if you're clever, if you really do it well, and you respond generously with a moment of that awe, like the Brahmaja competition, where you pushed language to a point. And this wasn't some kind of dry cerebral exercise. This is taking place during Greek Orthodox liturgy, which, if any of you have ever been to a Greek Orthodox uh, uh, mass, uh, is an extremely moving thing. Huge amounts of music, trumpets, marvelous processions, uh, theater that lift the soul. So all this is going on. You're saying, yes, God is that, but you're questioning scripture. And you're saying, you can't talk about God as a creator. He's not a creator like we are. And yet God is creator, but our words are inadequate. We just can't get our minds around it. Um, and this became, that we cannot know what God is. Um, he, but it, it, and if we do this, Dennis says, it takes us out of ourselves. We've got that self-emptying because we have to leave our, all our ideas behind, all our certainties, and enter with Moses, he said who went up the mountain, uh, just as the priest, and he, he points the, in the Greek Orthodox liturgy, the priest will go into the inner sanctum, amid great incense, clouds of incense, and trumpets blaring to uh, perform the, the, the consecration. And just as the, just as the priest does that, Moses, uh, it recalls Moses, who went up the mountain to speak to God. And on the mountain, the mountain was enveloped in cloud. And he could not see anything. But he was in the place where God is. Because when we allow ourselves to know we are in a cloud, we cannot see clearly. We don't know what God is. But then, in that Brahmodya moment, then we, we, we are in, in the presence of God. Uh, when we've left what he calls the idols of thought behind. That an idol is not just something, a statue that we bow down in front of, a, a, a statue of a false god. An idol is um, the elevation of any uh, human expression of the divine to absolute status. If we let those idols of our thought, idols of our certainty, idols of our faith go, then we can, we're ready to encounter God. It's that moment of unknowing when we've come to the end of what words and thoughts could do.